The TV show Don Quixote from Fred Rogers Productions expands on characters created by Mr. Rogers and empowers viewers to dream big and overcome obstacles. Chief Creative Officer for Fred Rogers Productions and Executive Producer of the show, Ellen Doherty, and Don Quixote puppeteer Haley Jenkins, join me for an exclusive look at Don Quixote on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now... Back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Well, I am very excited for this episode of Under the Puppet because we are going to be talking all about the incredible, fun new show, Don Quixote. And I'm super excited to be talking to Ellen Doherty, who is the executive producer. Ellen, welcome to the show. Thank you, Grant. So great to be here. Well, I'm super excited to talk to you um, because you've actually had a really incredible career in children's programming up to this point. And is it true? Because I read these things on the Internet. You don't always know they're true. But did you start on Reading Rainbow? Is that where you got your start? I did indeed. Yes, that was my first job. Uh, I was assistant to the producers on Reading Rainbow. And I was also a production intern literally days after I graduated from college. That's right into the fire there. (laughs) So what kind of things were you doing on Reading Rainbow as your job with the producers? As an assistant to the producers, I was managing the schedules for the top three producers on the show, Larry Lancet, Cecily Truitt, and Twyla Liggett. And it gave me an opportunity to really get to know production. The company is Lancet Media, or was Lancet Media, and they, uh, Larry and Cecily did other projects too. So actually, the first professional set I was on uh, after reading Rainbow was for a show called The Rory Story, which was puppets. It was a woman named Rory, sort of like a demo video for her, and featured puppets designed by Kevin Clash and performed by people that I don't remember the names of, but it was really interesting to work on. This is a very long time ago, but it was really, that was my first introduction to working with puppets, and it was absolutely fascinating to see how the puppet comes to life, even in the most modest of ways. Well, and you've you've had this great career working on sort of these children's programming, all these different shows you've worked on and working with Fred Rogers Productions and Reading Rainbow and stuff. Did you, what shows were like you interested in as a kid? And did those shows lead you to this point? Did you always just be like, that's what I want to do? I didn't figure out that kids media was what I wanted to do until college, but I can still draw a line back to a lot of what I watched when I was a kid. The Muppets, obviously, were huge. I think if I could have worked on any show, you know, in its prime time, this is my version of the, you know, who would you have at your dinner party kind of thing. I would have worked on the original Muppet show because I just think that was amazing and energetic and creative and just Weird. Weird is good in my book. And uh, I also watched, I think, just a real mix. Animation, live action, as I would now call it. Scripted, unscripted. You know, the Schoolhouse Rock videos really um, showed how, without thinking about it, really, like it was not something I focused on as a kid, but just was like showing the efficacy (laughs) of what you can learn through um, a cartoon. Because I remember being in Um, government class in high school. And when we had to write out the preamble to the Constitution on some quiz, like everybody in the room was humming the the schoolhouse rock version of that. Because it was like, we the people in order to form, you know, like it was just there. And that shows that that power of what media can do. Establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility. (laughs) Sorry, I had to hop in there. Yes, that is Haley Jenkins, a puppeteer from Don Quixote, who we'll be talking to as well. But it is infectious. You can't you can't not uh, jump in on it. It's interesting because a lot of your work, I mean, looking over your your IMDb page, um, you know, is sort of with this um, public television, I guess. I, I mean, I don't want to kind of pigeonhole it, but you've done a, you know a lot of work with Mr. Rogers and a lot of the shows have been. More than just, I I would say, like entertainment fluff. There's like a meaning behind, not that there's not meaning behind other shows, and I'm probably going to get angry letters now. But I'm saying the shows that you've worked on, though, have been these really, you know, kind of thoughtful shows, and especially your work with um, Fred Rogers Productions. Is this something that you, like, you kind of make a goal? Is like, I want to make TV that means something on different levels? 
Yeah, it, exactly that. Um, and that was the realization that I had in college, honestly, after going through as a communications major at Boston College. I had a conversation with my advisor, you know, at the end of end of term senior year. And he was like, what do you want to do? And I was like, well, I think um, something educational and kids. So probably PBS. But it was a big leap from that conversation to actually getting a job in it. But that idea of it's not about school school kind of learning, that's a different kind of learning, but it's that opportunity of learning um, as exemplified by Schoolhouse Rock. Um, Things that, like kids are curious creatures, right? And they just want to know stuff. And when they're interested in something, they want to know all about that something. And in my first job at Reading Rainbow, I think Reading Rainbow was an example of curiosity in action. Like that's what that show was about. It was, here's a book, that's really interesting. And now, you know, this is a book about trees. And so now we're going to go to a scientist who studies trees. And then we're going to show you something about how maple syrup is made. And then here's a bunch of kids telling you books about trees that you might want to read too. And it just like, that's just curiosity in action. And I think that good programming, it's not about teaching because I don't think TV teaches. That's what teachers do. We, um, what we say at FRP is that we create content that models an enthusiasm for learning, also that models kindness and respect. But that enthusiasm for learning, I would say another word for that is curiosity, just like feeding and encouraging curiosity. And it seems that you kind of do it through many different medium too, because Don Quixote is a, a puppet show, but you also have Daniel Tiger's show, which is animated. So it, it seems like you like to find these different kind of methods uh, or, or ways of presenting that curiosity. Exactly. And really, it's about what is the right method for that story. And Don Quixote actually started life as for us, this version, as an animated show, because puppets are not as... They're iconic with the Muppets and Sesame Street, but beyond that, they're not necessarily as popular present day. So we first started thinking about it as animation. And, you know, after a few months of doing that, we just, we wanted two things. We wanted to do this Don Quixote show and develop this idea of a little uh, preschooler, big ideas, big dreams, that impossible dream of the original Cervantes novel kind of thing. And we wanted to do a puppet show. And work with Adam and David Rudman because both I I had worked with Adam at Cyberchase, my previous job, and knew his writing really well. And Paul Siefkin, who's now the president of FRP, had worked with Adam and David when he was at PBS developing Nature Cat. So we knew that we wanted to work with Spiffy Pictures. And it just sort of hit me one day that this was the show, that it was Don Quixote needed to be puppets that idea of those big, big emotions, which Haley brings to life so beautifully with Donkey, those big emotions just hit differently with a puppet than they do in animation with a puppet with something that's huggable, literally huggable and visually. So just, you just want to hug her. She's so cute and fluffy. Like that expression of big emotions is so much more palpable, tangible, huggable, real, but also as soft as, as real life is. Whereas in animation, I think sometimes that would hit a little harder or a little harsher. It might feel a little bit more exaggerated versus when donkeys like, you know, it feels like, yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah. It does seem animation sort of, I guess, cause animation has like those hard lines too, you know, like to the character, there's a definite end to the character and um, yeah, it does seem that puppets are a lot more, um, you know, you do want to hug them. <laughs> I don't know yeah, how many they, times you want to hug SpongeBob. No offense to SpongeBob, but, uh, you know, like you want to hug Kermit, you know, because you know that that's a real thing that you can actually hug. Yes, exactly. And I think I will I will shout out to one particular animated show that is very huggable, which is, of course, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Right. But that is down to the design, which is very textural. So right. I think it really was one of those moments when it was like, this is the show. Don Quixote is a puppet show, and we know the perfect partners to work with. Great. Well, I, and I do want to talk um, more about the the genesis of the show and, and um, getting it started. But I did want to touch on you are the cr- chief creative officer of Fred Rogers Productions. And I would just love to know how you got involved uh, with the company and um, maybe a little bit about what your role is uh, with the company. 
Sure. Um, well, my role uh, as chief creative officer is to oversee all of the productions that we do and all of the creative development of new content, be it short form, long form, animation, live action, <laughs> scripted, unscripted. Fred Rogers Productions is a not for profit. So we're really mission driven. You know, we want to make sure to sell our shows because that's how you uh, fulfill our mission is by actually being able to make the shows that we that we want to make. But our goals and our measures of success all are all around impact. And we do the TV shows as well as educational outreach um, for public media programs and digital, the websites, games, um, and all sort of all platforms, expression, um, merchandise and um, books and things are part of that expression as well. Because kids just kind of think that the show should be wherever they are, you know, and sometimes that's in Target, sometimes that's in the library, you know, and on TV or on a tablet or phone, whatever, you know, they might be playing a game on. So I oversee all of that. And I got to FRP because I had been working in public media doing Cyber Chase, which is produced out of WNET in New York. And I had worked with Paul Siefkin, who's now president of FRP, when he was at PBS. So the two of us were sort of, uh, were peers uh, at different companies for about, I think, 10 years or so. And when Paul moved over to FRP and was going to become head of Fred Rogers' company at the time, we had a conversation and he said, I'm going to be president of the company and I would love for you to run production. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you were becoming president of the company and you want me to do what now? <laughs> and it was a great conversation because I really believed in what Paul was saying he wanted for his vision. And because we had worked together um, and known each other for 10 years, I had a, already a good sense of where we looked at things in a similar place, but also where we looked at things differently, which is a good thing too. So it was all of sort of one of those things of, I interviewed for the job over 10 years when I didn't know that I was doing it basically. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, in this business, it, it really is people want to work with you. You know what I mean? Like that a large portion, like, yeah, you can, you can go on an audition and you can, you know, impress somebody, but if they don't want to work with you, <laughs> they're not going to, they don't want to work with you. But that's why it's important to, when you're coming up to make all these great relationships with people where they'll, they'll want to work with you and then you'll have a job. So true. Careers are long, <laughs> <laughs> very long. I, yeah, you're exactly right. Well, let's let's talk about uh, Don Quixote. I know you touched on a little bit. What made him the good starting point uh, to create this show from? He has he because he had a funny name, honestly. <laughs> uh, we were in a meeting looking at you know the question was are there other characters from uh, that Fred Rogers created that we should be looking at to create new content around, and we had the list of characters up on a screen. And I don't remember this. Paul told the story. Like, I laughed at Don Quixote because I thought that was funny. I didn't remember the character either. And the name kind of gives you everything. That idea of the reference to Don Quixote and the idea of the impossible dream. And it just kind of all came together, you know, organically. The idea of a little donkey with big dreams. And um, I honestly don't quite remember what we talked about in the room that day. Um, which was like actually June of 2016. So just about six years ago, exactly, we had that meeting. The idea came together of the source inspiration with Don Quixote, the impossible dream, and preschoolers who have big dreams all the time that seem kind of impossible. In the beginning, you know, we talked about things like, you know, if you're four years old and you want to go on the really big slide at the park, that is a big deal. That is like, you've got you've to gotta feel brave to do that. And as the show developed, it became less real world and more um, someplace else. So it's not so much about our Don Quixote wanting to go onto a slide, but she wants to climb Mount really high up, you know, and really um, embracing the world of someplace else. Excellent. I, well, and it's, I think it's even... <laughs> You know, because I'm just even you're talking about going on the big slide. It's, uh, you know, I can remember being in junior high school going, I don't want to go on that roller coaster. So I think it's a theme that carries on throughout our whole lives, you know. Um, so it's it's really important. 
So you decided you wanted to work with uh, David and Adam on uh, the puppet aspect of it. How did you um, go about fleshing out the rest of the world? Because obviously, you know, Don Quixote is the the character, but there were other characters around her. Were um, you drawing from those uh, original characters that were in the land of make-believe? Yeah, it was a mix. The original concept as we had it with animation was a little donkey and a panda best friend. And that persisted. Um, We didn't initially set the show in someplace else. When we brought Adam and David on board, we uh, we sent them what we'd written so far. And we had a conversation. Should it be more Mr. Rogers? Not Mr. Rogers. Should it be its own thing? Should it reference Don Quixote in some way? Like that, should we have that part of it? Like, where, where does this go? And it really was through that conversation, which, by the way, conversation lasting months, right? That's the development process is just one big, long conversation. I think that Adam and David, Adam as the writer and now head writer of the series, really, they, they were really tickled by um, diving into Mr. Rogers' content. And one of them suggested uh, setting it in someplace else. I think that was really a turning point. We were wondering whether or not how how far to go into the Mr. Rogers side of things, because in 2016, before we had also Alma's Way launching and um, the people knew us, especially for Daniel Tiger, and we didn't want to be a company that only did Mr. Rogers IP, you know, so it was a strategic question as to whether or not how, how far we go into that legacy and in what way we go in. We ended up fully embracing that because it really felt right for the program, but it also felt unique and fresh. It didn't feel like a retread. Um, and if it had, we would have done something else. But the, the show that we have really blends beautifully Fred Rogers Productions, Spiffy Pictures, and Fred Rogers himself as that source inspiration. Excellent. Once the show was getting ready to shoot, you were, of course, looking for someone to play that lead character of Don Quixote. And um, we're lucky to have Haley here, uh, Haley Jenkins, um, the puppeteer of Don Quixote. But before we before I get to her and her audition process, I do want to ask, like, what were you looking for? What what sort of traits were you looking for in the puppeteer who was going to play that lead character? I mean, I think with Don Quixote, she is a character who is really so optimistic and upbeat and funny, but really feels all the big feelings. So, you know, doesn't just feel happy, you know, on a a beautiful day in the neighborhood, but also like when she's frustrated, she feels frustrated. And we needed somebody who could really capture and bring depth to all of those emotions and the story in the expression, both in vocal performance, of course, but also obviously in the in the puppeteering. And it really was an interesting process to think about like what who, you know, whenever you you go from just like the page and we had, you know, a 2D drawing of Donkey and then the puppet was made and we were able to, you know, have that manifestation, bringing in the performer to see how it comes to life and how the puppet comes to life was really, it's really interesting. And I think that what Haley brings is that depth, the nuance, the humor, the quirky and funny, you know, and again, a little weird in a great way. Like, you know, it is someplace else. It is not here. And, you know, the origin of someplace else from Fred Rogers, what he talked about was adults say to kids often, go play someplace else. That you're making too much noise, you're making too much mess, go play someplace else. Well, this is someplace else. This is the place where you can go do, be who you are, what you are, and bring fully yourself. And so we that means that the characters have to be really fully developed. They can't just be the one note kind of thing, which, you know, can happen. Yeah. Well, that is perfect. And that is a great segue to bring in uh, Haley Jenkins, who is the puppeteer of Don Quixote. And Haley, whenever I have a puppeteer on the show, um, I always like to ask the first question. Do you remember your first exposure to puppetry the first time you saw puppets? Ooh, oh, yeah. Um, My first memory of anything puppet wise was just my 
parents throwing a sheet over a line and doing shadow puppets for me when I was, I must have been like two. It's one of my first memories is just seeing my dog, my dad just do like the dog, you know, the, the simple <laughs> little dog hands. And, you know, my, my parents are not puppeteers, but uh, I, I, it was just, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. But yeah, that that's my very first puppet memory are those shadow puppets over the sheet with the light. That's great because that's a that's a personal memory too. That's like oh, yeah. you know your your parents are involved, and I'm sure you get quite this question a lot whenever you go on podcasts uh, or uh, do interviews for the show. Did you watch Mister Rogers when you were growing up? Absolutely, yes, <laughs> yeah. My um the the holy trinity of puppet shows that I watch were Mister Rogers Neighborhood, of course, Lamb Chop, couldn't get enough, and Sesame Street. But yeah, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was was really number one. It was so comforting and so funny in its own really weird way. Like if you if you go back and watch those those shows as an adult, he's got a weird sense of humor <laughs> that I didn't pick up on as a kid. I just knew I liked it and I couldn't figure out, you know, what it was. But yeah, Fred Rogers was absolutely hysterical. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I loved that show. Yeah, and I would love to know now, like I could have you on and we could do a whole hour of, of your entire puppetry career, but we're talking about Don Quixote. So yeah. I would love to know, what was the audition process like? How was your experience? Um, and, you know, a lot of times I see this podcast as something that other puppeteers who listen to, they can learn from. Mm. Uh, so I would just love to know your experience about where you heard about this show, how you got the audition and what that whole process was like. Yeah, great. So my... My audition process was sort of unique in that I heard from David Rudman um, directly. He reached out to me and asked if I would be interested in auditioning for Don Quixote. I think that they had already been through some rounds of auditions. And I know that they were looking at Alice Deneen, who was not available. I know she would have been fantastic. She's oh, she's one of the best performers out there. And so they were they were looking for someone to to fill Donkey's shoes. And I had worked with David on Sesame Street, but never really in this kind of a capacity. I had assisted Cookie Monster a handful of times, you know, and, and done lots of assist and, and, and little whatnot Muppets on, on Sesame Street. But never, I had never really gotten to do any real character work with David. And so first he reached out and, and had me send in an a audio audition just a couple of different takes of this donkey character. And they he sent me some sides. I gave kind of a, a couple of different options. But then the thing that he told me sold it for him was I sent him an option where it wasn't sides. I just started riffing about going to the fair. And like I, I just kind of made up my own side for something because I was like I just I want to play I want to feel free in this character I know that if I ever make it to this set there's going to be a lot of freedom and, and fun and, and exploration and sometimes when you're just reading sides you can get a little locked into those words and, and and not feel you know the real true energy of the character so I just sent him a just sort of an improvised thing about going to a fair and, and it was weird and it was and he he liked it a lot and he said that for him, what, what made him love what I did was that in the script, in, in the sides he sent me, you know, it said like, hee-haw, like it would, she would start out saying hee-haw. And he said that when I said it, I said like, hee-haw, hey, everybody. Like, he was like, you said it really casually, which they hadn't heard it said casually. And he was like, oh, that just really clicked for me. And so then they sent me the puppet. They sent me Donkey uh, just to make sure that I could puppeteer well enough to do it <laughs> um so i so yeah I, I filmed some stuff in my living room of her just kind of talking to camera walking around i think i pretended to make a sandwich or something <laughs> and then yeah and then and then i was hired and i was so thrilled and then they brought me in to do like a chemistry test with panda I guess Ellen, that I guess that was a chemistry test when it comes down to it. <laughs> we were told just to come in and play around, but we both knew we're like they're making they're making sure they're <laughs> they're making sure this works. Uh, but then yeah, then after that we were we were good to go, and the rest is history. Did you? You know, we've talked with Ellen about how this was, you know, it's taking place in someplace else, and it's it's not Don Quixote, it's mm -hmm. relative and all that stuff, but. 
Um, did you watch any of it to to any of the classic Don Quixote stuff, or did you just want to keep this like this is new, it's its own thing, and I don't want to be influenced by by what's come before? Um, I'm gonna say it was a little mix of both. I I did watch what I could find, uh, which was not a lot. I I couldn't find a lot of the original Don Quixote. There was there were a couple of clips I found online, and what I <laughs> what I initially grabbed onto from the original character is that there was some storyline where Don Quixote, the original Don Quixote, got in trouble because he tended to bite when he was upset. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. Like that's, of course, you know, our Don Quixote <laughs> doesn't bite anyone. <laughs> but I just had it in the back of my head of like, there's like, that's, there's like this little naughty streak that that is underneath all of it, just like like a kid, you know, and um, so I, I kind of held on to that in the back of my head. And Ellen, I don't, I don't know if you ever knew that, but like in the back of my head, sometimes when I'm performing her, I'm like, but she 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 might just want to bite something when she's really frustrated. She wouldn't. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I love that detail. Yeah, it just it just helped me help me find her 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 weirdness Um, that her her grandfather was once in trouble for biting just made me giggle. Well, it's funny because you mentioned for little kids, it's like when I was a kid, I I will admit I bit some people, yeah. <laughs> you know, like when you get just get that angry thing. So it is totally a kid thing totally. to get so mad. You want to ah, ah, bite something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's talk about um, your fellow castmates and and the other puppeteers on the set. We had um, Joy Mazzarino was on the show. And yeah. so we, we talked a little bit about Don Quixote there. But I would love to know from you, um, who are your co-puppeteers that uh, that you work with? Oh, yeah. So Frankie Cordero, of course, he's he is my partner in crime throughout this whole show, which is, has been so much fun. He's such a spontaneous, funny performer and such a fun scene partner what he does with purple panda is ridiculous <laughs> i wish you all could see all of the outtakes of everything because he just you know i mean everything that makes it onto the onto the screen is is hysterical and warm and really beautiful but he's just one of the funniest performers um so yeah I, you know we popped here with him a lot um stephanie de Bruzzo, of course she plays duck duck harriet elizabeth cow and uh and she voices so many of the other characters, so many like the the lesser, like the more one off characters. She's she's added her vocal talents too. Um, she's wonderful. She's Stephanie's just one of the most talented women out there. And then oh, Mel Campbell. So Mel Campbell is new to the scene. He's like 23 years old, maybe 24. He would he'd kill me if I get it wrong. But he has not only been one of our wonderful assists on the show he's also uh, voiced a lot of characters but he has written a few of the episodes and he writes a lot of the music for our show um, some of my personal favorite songs are all written by him he's such a talent uh, and a really nice guy and then let me see who who all works on okay Peter Lenz of course he's come in to do Clyde the Cloud uh, my husband Paul McGinnis was my assist which was one of the coolest things I've never, of course I've worked with him before, but we've never gotten to work on a show this long that, you know, that, that close together. And he, he added so much personality to donkey through what he, he does with her arms and everything. And what he adds to the show is awesome. And David. Yeah. Oh, of course. David Redman. How that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, Bob Dog and Grampy Hody, which is Grampy Hody is the original Don Quixote, but of course yep. we call him Grampy. David also, of course, directs. Um, so does Frankie. They both they both direct. Yeah. And uh Matt Vogel also does uh voices. He voices King Friday, but he has not gotten to come puppeteer with us in person. He's just been adding his his voice to it. And Ellen, am I forgetting anybody? I hope not. <laughs> I think that's everybody. Yeah. But I just also want to, I want to draw attention to the amazing work that Haley and Frankie and David and Stephanie have done and Mel, um, especially during the pandemic. Like Don Quixote season one was 40 weeks of production mm. and 34 of those weeks have happened since uh, the pandemic. We were... <laughs> 
we were six weeks in, in March of 2020. And I was in Chicago when, you know, we were all shooting the week that, you know, the world started to shut down that March 9th, March 13th kind of week. I wasn't in Chicago for over a year while the pandemic was at its height, uh, arguably its height, but everybody continued and was, you know, this is a show that is about perseverance, you know, perseverance, persistence, and problem solving. Season one, by every person who worked in the cast, on the crew, on the staff to create the show and produce 30, you know, well, 40 episodes altogether and shoot 34 of them during a pandemic. It, it's just amazing work that was achieved on any level. But when you add in the pandemic, it's just really like kudos to to Haley and Frankie and David and everybody who was on set every day. Oh, thanks, Ellen. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and I almost forgot to add in Frank Cesario. He's one of our um, he's one of our wranglers, but he has stepped in multiple times and saved the day when we've needed more puppeteers. And he's fantastic too. I would love to know how uh, this show because you've you've done a lot of puppetry, Haley, um, on various different projects, and you know, like you mentioned, Sesame Street and other things. Um, how has this show challenged you as a puppeteer? Oh, it's been challenging in a great way in that I've never worked on a show that is shot continuously for two years. You know, usually you have a season of something and it'll be, if you're lucky, a couple of months. And in that time, you know, you're really in it and you, you get into those characters, but then, then you have to say goodbye till the next year if the show comes back. But for this, we shot beginning November of 2019 and then we wrapped season one in December of 2021. Wow. Yeah. So uh, it was really cool um, getting to just sit in this character of Donkey for that long. I feel like she was molded to my hand by the end of it. I mean, she was molded to my hand by the end of it. There was a lot of sweat in that, in that puppet. Yeah. It was, it was very challenging keeping it fresh because you don't because we've been doing it for so long you don't want to get comfortable. You don't want every episode just to feel like the same kind of energy as the last one. And when you're shooting so much content, it it can be really easy to to get comfortable and to get lazy. And so it was really important to me just to to keep the energy up and to whenever I would, you know, read the new scripts that would come in just to Think of like what what different ways can I do this? What what ways can Donkey what's an unexpected thing that Donkey can feel in this scene or can do in this scene or or something that just just doesn't keep it comfortable? You want everything to feel fresh and new. And so that was a bit of a challenge, but a great challenge, one that I didn't expect in my career I'd ever get to do because a two year long season one shoot is unheard of. Uh, but it was awesome. Well, you you just ran through a list of incredibly su- supportive performers, some who I've met, some who I've not met um, or, or not met yet. And, uh, I, I, you know, I know that they are all incredibly supportive, but I, I do kind of want to ask if, you know, the show is called Don Quixote and you play Don Quixote. And I just wonder if there is uh, just sort of this pressure if there's any sort of pressure and maybe not because the, the re- everybody else is so supportive, but it's kind of the show is about your character, you know, is there any sort of pressure that goes along with that? You know, in the beginning there was, I think I put that pressure on myself in the beginning because I was like, Oh my gosh, it's I'm Don Quixote and it's called Don Quixote. And exactly what you just said was going through my mind. But then the second I walked onto the set, honestly, it's just, you got to put those thoughts at the door because it doesn't matter if you're playing Don Quixote or if you're playing a, a nameless squirrel, (laughs) like it's, it's all just as important as the the quote main character. And and you're right. Like I have a really supportive team of people who just, we all think that each other, we, we all feel like we're very funny together as a group. <laughs> you know, we uh, like, I just, I think that all of my, my co-stars are hilarious, talented people. And so it's really, really easy to, to just not think of yourself as, oh, I'm the lead Don Quixote because I'm just constantly in awe of everybody else's work. And I think that if I was in that mindset of I'm the lead of a show, <laughs> I think it would 
be really hard to create the best content I could because that is a lot of pressure. And at the end of the day, it's just not about that. It's about the relationships between everyone. It's about the storytelling and, you know, it's not about, it's not about donkey. We have episodes where donkey is not in any way the, the main storyteller, (laughs) you know, where it's just not about her. And those are some of the best episodes we've got. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I'm really happy that's such a good ensemble. Yeah, I, and I was going to ask too, you are playing Don Quixote, but like those episodes you mentioned where it's maybe not the main story isn't about Don Quixote, it's about mm-hmm. somebody else. Do you jump in and puppeteer other things? Because I think this is an important thing for other puppeteers to hear who maybe haven't worked on a show. Is it sort of that Sesame Street Muppet style where it's like, yeah, you're puppeteering, even though you're this character, you're puppeteering on everything? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. In every episode, there's some point where we're jumping in and doing things that aren't our main characters. And, that, and that's always so fun. It's it's very freeing to, you know, to get to put Donkey down for a little while and put on a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, um, it's, a, it's a super fun show. And I know that um, we want to talk a little bit about the future of uh, mm-hmm. Donkey Hody and what's coming up. And you are going to be making more episodes. And Ellen, you can jump in here as well, too. And you also, I'd love to talk talk about new episodes coming up, but also um, you also just had sort of an open call for puppeteers as well. We did, yeah. And we got a great response. And we have one of the puppeteers through that process to the season two work, and she'll be starting with us. But I am, don't know if we're announcing the name or not now, so I'm not going to say anything. But like, <laughs> mm-hmm. but yeah, it was great. And, um, you know, we look forward to being able to hopefully continue to find new talent that we can bring on to the show and help just, you know, grow the world of TV puppetry. Yeah. Cause a lot, I mean, a lot of times television puppet shows don't have big open calls like that. So it was really great to see. And I know a lot of people were very excited about having that opportunity. When does production start or has it, has pre-production already started or are you shooting already or, or what's happening with, um, with Don Quixote season two? Uh, well, pre-production has started, uh, started in um, January, and uh, we begin shooting. We shot last month. <laughs> we started shooting in, yeah. in July of uh, 2022. Yeah. So, Excellent. Yeah, we've been out for a month. <laughs> and is there anything, um, you know, I don't we necessarily have spoilers about uh, Don Quixote season two, but is there anything that's like, we're going to explore this a little bit more in this season or, uh, you know, I, I, again, we don't want spoilers for the diehard Don Quixote fans. I'm going to say, and, and no spoilers here. Don't worry, Ellen. <laughs> yeah. But um, something I'm really excited about is that the actual world is expanding a bit. Um, some locations and stuff are, are, are being expanded on and that's going to be so much fun to play in. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I also hear that you have a special Don Quixote Halloween episode coming up. We do. Uh, A Don Quixote Halloween is going to premiere on PBS Kids in October. It's really, it's a fun musical half hour special um, where Donkey. Oh, but spoilers, Ellen, the spoilers. (laughs) (laughs) Give us the broad strokes. Purple Panda comes from Planet Purple, where Halloween is not celebrated. So a Don Quixote Halloween focuses on Donkey and all the pals helping Panda through his first Halloween. And he gets a little scared because some of the stuff is surprising. He doesn't know what a jack-o'-lantern is. The decorations are a little spooky. And so Donkey creates the Halloween Help Academy to help Purple Panda have a really fun Halloween. Excellent. Well, we will all look forward to that. That sounds like uh, that sounds like a, a special the whole family can watch together. Absolutely. And sing along to the music's really great. Do you release any of the songs? Like, can people go to uh, Apple Music and stuff and download them? Absolutely. There is a the first album uh, came out in April. Um, So there is uh, I think it's just called Don Quixote. Um, But yes, you can search Don Quixote on Apple Music or wherever you get your music. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, I would love to ask what if someone watches some they've never seen the show before and they just it, flipping channels, it's on. What do you want people to take away from when they watch an episode of Don Quixote? And this can be for both of you. Something I'd really like people to take away from is the weirdness of this show in the best way. 
it's I mean, it's it's a really it, it has a lot of heart, of course, but it's not one of those shows for preschoolers that's just like happy and love and, and all that stuff all the time. There's some really big feelings and frustrations and, and characters can get upset with each other and then work that out. And, you know, there there's just um, there's a lot of depth to this show, but there's also an incredible amount of weirdness. Like one of my favorite episodes it's an episode where the whole thing is just that all of the characters, all the the main four, um, Donkey, Panda, Duck, Duck, and Bob Dog, they all get stuck to a giant glue bottle. And they're just trying to figure out how to get unstuck from this bottle of glue. It's, it's just fun. That's the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a really quirky show. And, and also, there are a lot of little magic tricks in the show. We do a lot of how do I put this? A, a lot of our, I guess, tricks, I don't, I don't know any other word to use, are actually done live on set. Like we have um, a moment where Grampy is is juggling coconuts uh, early on in season one. And that was not done in post. That was done live on the set with some really cool rigging that I cannot reveal because <laughs> <laughs> our on-set magician would kill me. So it's like practical effects is what you're... Yeah. Oh, yeah. All practical. That's awesome. Yeah. And Ellen, how about you? What do you, what do you hope people take away from an episode of Don Quixote? Um, I hope that kids feel empowered, that they feel like they can do big things too. In every episode, Donkey says two things. I, Don Quixote, will, and she has a goal for this story. Um, sometimes they're kind of little goals. Sometimes they're very big goals. Sometimes her goal is to help a friend. And uh, the other thing that she says in service of that goal <laughs> is think, Don Quixote, think. And those are things that I hope over time kids will also be saying to themselves because those are um, those are in there for a reason, which is that they're they're ways that um, we all can model thinking of yourself in this way. It's sort of like thinking of yourself like a superhero, thinking of yourself in the third person is actually something that is found to be um, encouraging and empowering. So if a kid is watching and is like, I, Ellen, will eat the broccoli at dinner, that would be amazing. I personally will not eat the broccoli at dinner, to be clear, but I will eat the Brussels sprouts. Um, you have to watch that, a few more that, episodes yeah, of the show. And then yeah, I, the... no, no, no. Broccoli, maybe never. But um, <laughs> but that idea of, you know, if they, if they see, um, feel empowered by what Donkey does and what she goes through, what Panda goes through, how Panda's a good pal, how Donkey can be a good pal too, and how they get through, you know, challenges together, that would be amazing. So I think coming out of it feeling really like, like optimistic and, and I can do things too. Excellent. Well, uh, Ellen, Haley, thank you so much for being on the show today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Grant. This was awesome getting a chance to chat with you. I love your podcast. <laughs> thank you. <Yeah. laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Really. It's always happy to talk about Don Quixote. My thanks to Ellen Doherty and Haley Jenkins for being on this episode of the show. For links to Don Quixote, as well as to some of the things we discussed, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 74, over at underthepuppet.com. And if you'd like to hear even more of my talk with Ellen and Haley, download the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android and click on the gift icon in the listing for this episode. Special thanks to Allison Grand and Eliza Paprin for helping schedule this interview. Well, now it's time to announce the winner of episode 73's giveaway for a copy of the book, Punch and Judy, A Short History with Original Dialogue by John Payne Collier. The question was, what did Broderick Jones make the original Dr. Cranium puppet out of? And the answer was, a protein powder can, mat board, rubber bands, and Sculpey. And the winner is Tyler Jacobs. Congratulations, Tyler. Your copy of Punch and Judy, A Short History with Original Dialogue is on its way to you right now. This episode, we're giving away a $50 gift card to PuppetPelts.com. Now, if you're looking for supplies to build your very own puppet friend, PuppetPelts.com has just about everything you could want. To be entered to win this gift card, all you have to do is answer this question from the episode you just heard. What objects did Haley say Grampy was juggling in season one that was all shot in camera with no after effects? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by August 15th, 2022. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the September 2022 episode of the show. 
one entry per household. Good luck. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I want to send a special thank you out to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who help make this show possible. Patreon patrons at the producer level and above who get a special little shout out are Vicky Sebring, David Akers, Tony Urbano, Kathy Crawford, Eve Cunning, and Dorothy Bachoco. To become a patron, head on over to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. And thank you for your support. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604 or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your suggestions via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com or you can connect with the show on Instagram or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staver and featured music by Dan Rank. Help spread the word about the show by sharing your favorite Under the Puppet episode with a friend. Under the Puppet is copyright 2022 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents The Adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth Reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.